mention anything. Yeah, just enough to see if... Is my, is my bare leg showing? No, uh, well... I'm getting that much, well fine. Yeah, I got that. I can get it. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Don't do that. <coughs> five children, and uh, he taught in a business school for a while. I always thought that was a mighty nice thing, but I was so young then, I really didn't appreciate it, I guess, like I would now. But uh, building things, and it was a delight to make them one kind of thing or another. And my brother was quite interested in electronics. He had one of those real early radios. I remember one day going up in the attic where he usually worked and asking him why he didn't use that coil. And he was using it, and I drew about a half-inch spark. So that was the last of my interest for that day in electronics. And uh, over the years, I've just been interested in building things. And, uh, in chemistry, I went to Oberlin College. We had a very fine professor. And uh, Harry N. Holmes was president of the Chemical Society one time. He was our lecturer. But I had very fine teachers. And when I was about to graduate, the uh, Illinois had sent a, a man to Oberlin to interest some of the students. And uh, although I had a chance to go to, to Hopkins, they didn't send anybody. And I chose Illinois, I think, on the basis of this visit by Dr. Quill and went out there. Working what year was Hopkins. that? Hopkins. Hmm? What year was that? That was in 1928. Uh, graduated in 28. And I got my master's degree in 29 and PhD in 31, working in rare earths, attempting their separation one scheme after another. And uh, in that, at that time, Dr. Allison, Fred Allison, was working here in Auburn on uh, his magneto-optic apparatus and writing for the Journal of Chemical Society. And uh, one of the things that Dr. Hopkins seemed to like to do, as far as I heard from other graduate students, was to uh, review papers and his method was to turn them over to the graduate student and you wrote a review and he turned it in i think he read it turned it in collected the little bit of money that came from it and he never saw any money <laughs> but he had lots of reviewing to do and he was a prolific writer he was writing something all the time uh, my wife was his secretary for a number of years, and uh, that was how we got acquainted. And after I got my degree, I stayed two more years on a fellowship. And then the big depression came, and that was that. Uh, in that time, one of the papers that we reviewed was Dr. Ellison's paper. And I said to Dr. Hopkins, it looks to me like this man has got something that we would like to use because it's so very sensitive and it seems to be independent of other materials present. So he wrote to him and uh, suggested that we would like to get together. And Dr. Allison immediately wrote back and said, well, send us some samples of the pure earths as you see them, and we'll see what what happens in our machine, what, whether we can get readings. And uh, so we did very small samples, about five milligrams samples, because rare earths were pretty expensive at that time, 
maybe still on. But we sent him a good number of them. And uh, when he wrote back and said that that was, that was the results that he had gotten were included, um, I said to Dr. Hopkins, you know, this just looks a little too good to me. Why don't we ask him if there's any impurity in a gadolinium sample, which we had been preparing for atomic weight determination. And um, because we had found it contained about a thousandth percent of europium, which we hadn't been able to remove at that time. So we sent it back, sent that letter back. And uh, Dr. Allison reported almost immediately afterwards that that's what it was, European, small amount. He didn't say how much, small amount. So Dr. Hopkins and I came down here to Auburn for a little visit. And uh, Dr. Allison showed us the apparatus and uh, explained how it worked. And then we asked him if he would look at a sample of element 61 that we thought contained element 61, which he did and claimed that there was such an element there, that at least in his, his uh, extrapolated uh, or interpolated data, there was a reaction at the place where he expected it to be. So when the depression closed down that work on element 61. Uh, Dr. Allison had lost one of his staff members to the TVA and asked me to come down and take his place. And uh, I did that. I had built his apparatus at Illinois and used it, so I knew about it. So I came down in 1933, and I'm still here. No, element 61 at that time was... It was just another rare earth. But later than that, you know, it was shown that element 61 would not exist except as a, a radioactive isotope, a radioactive element. And what that was, I don't know today. What the um, effect that he got at, at the position uh, in his data for element 61. I don't know that. Now you mentioned alinium. Well, alinium is element 61. That was the name Dr. Hopkins had given to it. And were you involved with that at all? With alinium? Oh, yes. All of Dr. Hopkins' graduate <laughs> students were involved in, with alinium. When I went there as a graduate student to Illinois, uh, I remember Dr. Hopkins walking me down the hall, signing me up for summer courses, because I went there immediately following graduation from Oberlin. And uh, then we got to the laboratory, and he pointed to three large barrels sitting over along the wall, and he said, now there is your summer work. That material comes from monazite sands, it's from the Wellsbach Mantle Company, and the process you're to put it through uh, is to take, take out the cerium, so we have only the other earths left. They had a chemical process for that. So at the end of the first summer, I had about a third of one barrel done. And <laughs> I spent quite a bit of time during the winter, the school term, was after the summer term, uh, thinking how on earth I was ever going to get all of that material done. And by the spring, I realized that the only thing to do was to set up a little small-scale production line. And I finished two and a half barrels of that material in the, the summer, summer term. It wasn't a quarter, it was just a term. And it... Uh, it went right along. It was it was easy to do that. They had vacuum, air pressure, electricity, DC, and everything you need there, and big big size uh, evaporating dishes and all of that sort of thing. 
So it wasn't too difficult after I got the technique of setting it up and doing it. And that was a lot of material. And following that, I set up the X-ray spectrometer and uh, spent many, many hours doing fractional crystallization of that material to separate the rare earths. Now, I wouldn't say that we ever uh, had a handful of millennium or anything like that, but we did have material which we felt contained an appreciable amount of millennium. An appreciable amount would have been maybe a tenth of a percent or something like that. What's happened after that, I, I have no idea. When I came down here, I corresponded with Dr. Hopkins quite often. And we ran more samples with Dr. Allison's apparatus and got the results just as we, just as he had gotten them before. But uh, what his his program at Illinois was, I have no idea. But Dr. Allison and I continued working with the the uh, magneto optic apparatus, and. Uh, he had always used the apparatus for visual work. I mean, his, when he developed his data, it was from his own visual work. And the, the apparatus is relatively simple. It was based on the fact of uh, some work by uh, people at Virginia a man named Beams, Jesse Beams, who were interested in finding a very a scheme to make very short pulses of light. Well, uh, what their scheme was was to use the Carr effect. And the Carr effect is a birefringent effect that is develop when uh, the proper liquid is placed in an electric field. Uh, the, the polarized light going through such a, a liquid uh, has two indices of refraction developed. So if you have plain polarized light starting in, you have elliptically polarized light coming out if the material is in an electric field. And uh, this, this use of the car effect uh, in a double sense, where they had two such cells uh, filled with the nitrobenzene, which is the best uh, material for showing this effect. Uh, what they did was to connect them to a, connect each cell to a um, uh, source of voltage and then let the voltage collapse across the spark gap. And if one cell was farther away from the spark gap than the other cell, why well, it would take the charge a little time to get to the second cell and in that time the light would pass through this this system, but uh, any other time no light would pass through it, so they would get a, a very short pulse of light. Well, Dr. Allison helped these people one summer, and when he came back to Auburn, he he wondered why why you couldn't do the same thing with the magnetic field using the Faraday effect. So he set up two coils. Uh, and put liquids in them, organic liquids to start. And he connected them then to a, to a uh, source of high voltage, such that when a spark in the high voltage circuit went off, uh, the two coils got a sudden surge of current. And the, the Faraday effect, which is a optical active effect, optical activity effect, 
then uh, would, would produce this effect at different times. And if he moved the coils relative to the source of light, to each other, not to the source of light, but relative to each other, he might be able to find a point where the two actions were exactly at the same time and would cancel each other. And he calls such a thing a minimum of light. That was his minimum, a minimum. Instead of moving the coils, which takes quite a little doing, uh, when you have uh, a little more than wood to work with, <laughs> that was what he had. It was much easier to arrange a, a long electric circuit and have a sliding contact so that you brought the surge to the coils at different times rather than having the light come at different times. And the scale readings that he would record were just the scale readings when the matching of the Faraday effects were ideal. And that was the, the magneto-optic effect that Dr. Alice developed. Well, you would look in this apparatus. The source of light was a spark, a magnesium spark. It was blue. You uh, washed it. It was not. Uh, it was not a steady source of light, although it was fairly steady. And as you moved this sliding contact and watched it, uh, quite suddenly it would change. Very small amount. It was difficult to operate, difficult to see, and very tiring. And. Uh, that was the visual work that he based all of his research on. And of course the question came up, why not photograph it? Why not do it photoelectrically? And uh, that was the, the problem that he worked on, I would say, from 1940 to till he died in 19. I think 54, I believe it was. Uh, he was a very careful worker, very careful. Uh, he was, he couldn't have been a more careful, cleaner worker. One time he told me that this apparatus turned out to be very sensitive. He stopped using organic compounds. He said that uh, he felt that you just couldn't get purity in organic compounds like you could get them in inorganic compounds. So he started making up solutions, water solutions, and he had stills to produce the water. He had a Barnstead still followed by a Pyrex still, and when he got to work on some calcium, he used a, a quartz still. He was very careful about that. He told me one time that he made a, a solution of one part per million in one of his cells that he used for observation. And uh, he rinsed it out repeatedly until he could no longer see the minimum for whatever was in the cell, which I forgot. And he rinsed that thing out 54 times filling the cell, shaking it around, pouring it out, filling it again, look to see if the men were there, shake it around, pour it out, and so on. So I thought then that that was going a little too far. He didn't. He was very careful worker. And uh, he didn't mind doing things over and over and over again. He developed a great amount of data for different uh, chemical compounds. He found that at that time, the number of isotopes that were known for the different elements was 
essentially the same number of readings that he got for any one element in, the, in his observations. So he thought that the minima were being produced by each isotope. Of course, it was interesting at the first there, when he was using the organic compounds, if he, if he put in, say, benzene, got the minimum, put in toluene, got the minimum, then mix the two. Would he get the average of the two, or would he, what would he get? Well, he found he got each one. There wasn't any averaging effect. It was more like a spectrum. Each spectrum line shows by itself. What he had there was each, L, each compound was showing by itself. And this was true in the inorganic compounds as well. But it's also true for the isotopes. Since the number of isotopes that Aston had found corresponded quite, quite well with, not completely well, but quite well with the number of readings he got for any particular uh, element that he was looking at. And the salts, he found that, say, you have uh, sodium chloride. Uh, I don't remember how many isotopes sodium has, which is more than one. But the chlorine part of that, he didn't get any two isotopes for chlorine. This was a mystery to him. He never, never had a good explanation for that. But most of his work at the, in the later years was trying to get this effect photographed, trying to get it uh, photoelectrically. And I did quite a bit of the work on the photography part of it. And we thought we had, at one time, uh, succeeded in doing that. I published a paper in the uh, journal, I believe it was the Journal of Chemical Education. And, uh, but it was an extremely small effect. Well, I never really figured out why it should have been so small to uh, be visible. But we did set up a system one time, an optical system, where we could change the level of blue light. We could change the intensity variation and the speed with which the variation occurred. And when you change the speed, the rate at which pulses of light come to you, when you get around 10 to 12, 13 pulses a second, the eye is very sensitive to small changes in intensity. In other words, if you have the first pulse with intensity A and the second pulse 99% of A, the third pulse A, the next one 99%, and they come 12 a second, you can see that. I'm not sure whether it's 99%, but it's, it's a small change. So that perhaps photographing it should have been a small effect. If the eye can see that, and the eye sees the minima, uh, then maybe photographically it should have been that. There were a number of things that uh, might have occurred photographically, and we never were sure which ones were the, the critical ones. Well, Dr. Allison tried many different photoelectric circuits. In those days, uh, the old-type photocells were quite insensitive compared to today. Uh, then we went through the photomultipliers. There it took a very high voltage and uh, maybe a thousand volts or more. And the sensitivity was very high. But the sensitivity to electrical noise was also very high. And of course we had the we had about 15 kilovolts on our spark caps. I don't think they, they ever went at 
at 15 kilovolts is more like about 8 kilovolts the sp uh, spark cap would break down. But we certainly filled the lab with a lot of radiation, which it would have been fine to uh, not have, because you would pick up all of that random signal in the photoelectric signals. So we never did, he never did, and I never did working with him, uh, succeed in getting uh, the minima uh, to record photoelectrically. We thought we had it at times, but we never were sure enough to publish that. So I remember the last day that Dr. Allison worked. Uh, he came in the lab and he wasn't well. He had, uh, I think, leukemia, and he was uh, he was 92, but he still wanted to get that. He retired long before that and worked in the lab day after day after day. And he said to me, uh, if anybody is going to get this thing, it'll have to be somebody else. I've got to quit. And then his health just went downhill. He died after shortly after that. You got any questions? Well, how would you describe him as a person? How would, what? How would you describe him as a personality? As a man? In the 1930s when he was... He was, he was short, and he was very wiry, and full of pep. And I remember losing to him in tennis on more than one occasion. <laughs> and he lived right next door to the tennis court. He loved cats. He had one called Bluebell, which he just thought was great. He didn't live far from the campus. He uh, was a very, a, a very pleasant man. He had friends on every side and uh, always had a new story to tell you. And I recall many times at parties of one kind and another, he would have a group of people telling them a story, and uh, Mrs. Allison would walk by, and she would hear a little of the story, and she would say, now Fred? <laughs> and Dr. Allison would change the subject right then. <laughs> But uh, I never saw him provoked except once. And we had a young man working with us who simply went off and let one of the Pyrex stills run dry and it cracked. And of course, we didn't have much money in those days. And uh, to lose a still was uh, quite a disaster. And he was provoked for that man. But other than that, he never was provoked. He never, he was, uh, he always was happy, always pleasant. Uh, he worked morning, noon, and night, and Saturdays and Sundays. In fact, in the first of his work with the magneto optic apparatus, that high voltage spark was very troublesome to the people in Auburn because in those days radios were quite susceptible to interference and when you had to, one of the shows on that you wanted to see and all of a sudden there was that racket in it everyone said well that Fred Allison is at it again and Auburn was a very small town <laughs> And the people were quite, they lived quite close to the university. And uh, uh, he didn't lose any friends, but he did uh, quit that sort of thing. He didn't mind going over there at 4 o'clock in the morning and working until 6 or 7, or before the news came on, if there was news on the local station. And... Uh, but he quit the, the late night part. But he, he was, at one time, Dr. Allison was very wiry, very small. 
and he had a nickname of Bullet because he walked so fast across the <laughs> campus. At one time here in Auburn, we had snow. Of course, this is a little far south for snow. And uh, the students decided they would they would make a lot of snowballs and really get the professors. And the Council of Deans got together and decided that anybody caught snowballing a professor uh, would be thrown out of school. <laughs> Dr. Allison heard about it, went to the president's office where the deans were meeting, and said to them, now, how often do you think we have snow? And they agreed that it wasn't very often. And then he said, and how often do you think you're going to hear about this regulation that you've just passed in the newspapers? <laughs> they decided they would uh, table that one for a long, long time. But uh, he was very active. He was active in his church work. He, uh, after he was the department head for some time, uh, they made him the dean of the graduate school, and uh, he was an excellent administrator. I remember very well at the beginning of World War II, he went to Washington and um, to the Physical Society. When he came back, he said to me, uh, Gordon, I, I signed you up for a new job. I said, well, Dr. Allison, is there something wrong with what I've been doing around here? He said, no, but we're going to be in difficulty. This was about, well, you know, May or June when he went up there for the meeting. Uh, I said, well, uh, what's the new job? Well, he said, at the Naval Ordnance Laboratory, they need physicists to work in magnetism. So uh, I said, well, I'll talk it over with my wife, we'll see. And we decided to go, so I was gone for two years, and he wrote one day and said, that, your leave of absence is up, come home. So there was nothing to do but to come home if I wanted to retain my job. And when I got off the train, Dr. Allison met me, and he said, now come over to school. I want you to talk to Dr. Duncan, the president, because I'm going to leave tomorrow. I said, well, Dr. Allison, uh, wh where are you going? Well, he said, I'm going to University of Virginia to do war research. <laughs> and he had me here taking all of his classes, and he was taking off. So that wasn't too bad. He stayed away about, uh, oh, I guess two or three years uh, doing research and proximity fuses. But when he came back, he was just the same man. He hadn't changed a bit. When he retired, he wanted to go back to Emory and Henry and uh, teach there. And I remember saying to him, well, Dr. Allison, that's where you went to school. It's been 50 years ago. He said, you don't need to remind me of that. That was 50 years ago, all right. So he went up there for about two years. And then he wanted to come back to Auburn. But he worked for the government for a while. They sent him to Thailand. And uh, when he came back from there, uh, he, he wanted to teach some more. And we had been down at Stetson University to look the place over for my son to go to school there. And uh, I suggested Dr. Ellison think of that place, but he didn't, he wasn't interested in getting that far away from home. What he wanted was a place where he could come home uh, every week. So he went down to Huntington College and he taught there for about 12 years. And one of the things that I remember he did at Huntington, they never had much money for physics. And he was always building something on the weekend. He would make this or make that, something else to put in the laboratory. 
And one day, Edmund Scientific had advertised, and I had bought from them uh, four or five pieces of glass, which they said were prison windows. That uh, these pieces of glass were three or four inches in diameter, and uh, they were supposed to have a uh, the deviation from the prism was just a few minutes of arc. And I said, Dr. Allison, you know, uh, a piece of glass that just is, uh, is uh, made so that the deviation is just a little bit angled like that, that has to be a very flat piece of glass. And I got some of those for windows in a piece of apparatus I'm building. And I said, that that's exactly what they are. They're just perfectly flat because I had checked them to, as, with an interferometer uh, scheme, and they were very flat. He said, that's just what I'm looking for. And he ordered two, but while they were coming, he took two of mine, and he made himself a Fabry and Perot interferometer, a wood frame with those two pieces of glass. In, and it worked fine. And they took it to Huntington College, and that's what they use for their interferometer experiment in the physics lab. That piece, those pieces of glass. But uh, he was always making things, always out of wood. One of the things he did, uh, he kept bees. He had more beehives in the backyard than you shake a stick at. There were just lots of them. And he said his fellow workers, they met the bees. And he took good care of them and uh, produced a lot of honey, which they liked. And he, he gave his friends honey endlessly. And he knew quite a bit about bees. Uh, he understood their needs and he understood the varieties. And there was a place not too far away from here where a man does it professionally, raises, raises queen bees, and uh, he would go there and get new, new uh, hives. But at the end of his life, he couldn't, he just couldn't handle the beehives, so he kind of let them go. And, uh, but that was his, that was his uh, hobby, if he had any, other than working in the lab, working in his lab. Now, he and I worked on that thing together from 33 to 54. And we still didn't get what we wanted. We got a lot, but we didn't get what we wanted. And what was it you wanted? Well, we wanted to record this diminution in the light, photoelectrically or photographically, so it would be consistent, big enough to be acceptable, and then publish that. That would prove his his uh, work for all those years. <coughs> but we never got that. And I sure am sorry that we didn't, because that would have been a fine thing for him. And I'm still interested in it. I keep thinking about it, thinking of things we might have done. But as he worked at different things, well, I, I took on different different things. Now, one thing we did do together, uh, we had a young man here who was a very promising uh, physicist, went to Caltech, made a lot of friends there. Uh, he came back and talked with us for a while, but he was very much interested in the in the Air Force, the work in Dayton, Wright Patterson. And he ended up as the chief scientist for the Air Force at Holloman Air Force Base. And they put on a summer program of consultants, and Dr. Allison, who had retired then, and Dr. Carr, Howard Carr, who was then the head of the department, and I, and uh, Maybe one other man, I can't remember whether he went that year or not. But we all went out to Holman Air Force Base in Alamogordo, New Mexico. 
And we had a glorious summer. It was just wonderful. We were working on a solar furnace scheme they wanted to build up in the mountains. And Dr. Allison took a very active part in, in planning and, and uh, experimenting with that sort of thing. And one of the things we did, we built a solar um, oh, uh, radiometer to measure the solar constant. <laughs> All we had was some wire and some silver money and uh, uh, we had a, a, a pair of um, nail clippers and we built the whole darn thing. The Air Force furnished us a potentiometer. And, uh, but we built the whole thing and we, we didn't work anywhere except in the high school home economics laboratory. And the reason we worked there was because it was so cold there in the morning, it was up 9,600 feet. It was so cold in the morning, we'd go over to the home economics laboratory and turn on all the ovens. And, but Dr. Allison really enjoyed that. He, he thought that was great to go out there. And we spent, uh, I think he was out there two two summers and uh, but it was it was a fine experience which he enjoyed very much and going out to White Sands on a picnic he would play around on the sand dunes just like a youngster and just just having a glorious time but we had we had a lot of people there who <laughs> we had John Strong there from Johns Hopkins or he wasn't Hopkins then and uh, Bill Baum from Caltech. They had many, many outstanding physicists and mechanical engineers and uh, people who were interested in, in the solar furnace as a, a big uh, installation. So Dr. Allison was he had an active part in that. He really enjoyed that. What if maybe start looking for the isotopes with the magneto-optic effect? Well, you know, uh, uh, one of the things that he did, when he, when he was examining acids, uh, hydrochloric acid was such an easy thing to use. He could take the best sample of water and just hold the stopper from the HCl bottle over the water and he had the minima there for uh, hydrochloric acid. There's no question about it. And he always found two, two minima. Well, that was about the time when there was a question of uh, the isotope of hydrogen. Theoretically, people said there should have been an isotope of hydrogen. But nobody had found it. And I remember the paper that Dr. Allison gave at, um, I think it was either Tampa or St. Petersburg, the meeting of the Chemical Society. He reported that all of the acids that he had ever examined had two minima. And he couldn't explain that any other way except to say, that hydrogen had an isotope. But he didn't say that he had discovered a hydrogen isotope. He said that was the only explanation that he could, he could make out of it. Well, uh, the man from uh, Columbia, was it? Yuri? Mm -hmm. Yuri. Yuri stopped here one time. And Dr. Allison showed him the apparatus, and Yuri agreed that uh, he could see the minima, and sure enough, there were two in acids. And then he went home and discovered the other isotope of hydrogen. And uh, it upset Dr. Allison quite a bit that he was never mentioned. But I think all of that correspondence is still over in the 
archives. If you'd like to ask the archivist to look for that, uh, I think you'd find you'll find a lot of other other correspondence over there. And the interesting thing to me about many of many people who tried the magneto optic apparatus, they were physicists. And a physicist's idea of being clean was to wash your hands before you picked up that little sample of salt from a bottle and put it in the in the apparatus. <laughs> and most of those letters, and I remember when they came to Dr. Allison and different people, they would say, well, the apparatus is working fine. And a week or two later, uh, we seem to find some spurious minima. And a week or two after that, we find more minima than we know what to do with. And we don't know what to do, so we're giving it up. And I thought every time, well, that's a typical physicist. I was one of them, <laughs> you know. Um, well, I think that's, that's shown. The first dark room that I had in Auburn had a dirt floor. If you can imagine a dark room with a dirt floor. It's in the basement. They had never put down a floor. And that was the dark room. You can imagine how clean that was. So uh, it's not like it is today. A far cry from that. But when Dr. Allison discovered that the, the minimum for hydrogen, that was one of the uh, kind of the turning points, I think, in his, his work. Because then he looked at many other elements to see if the number of, isot if the number of minima was the same as the number of isotopes that Aston had reported. Uh, now, Aston's work, you know, has been greatly improved upon, uh, more sensitive and all of that. The fellow at Oak Ridge, whose specialty is that, and my goodness, his apparatus is, I think his name was Baldock, his apparatus is a uh, far cry from what it was in Aston's day. But, uh, and I don't know whether the modern data would would bear out that conclusion of Dr. Allison's or not. Of course, he didn't have any radioactive isotopes. All these samples were just straight chemicals. Now, if we got up into uranium, something like that would be different, but we're not talking about that. Well, um, the credit for discovering these isotopes uh, was given to him for some time, if I remember correctly. Uh, yes, he, he felt that for elements 85 and 87, Alabama, Eden, Virginia, they called them, that uh, he detected them the same way he had detected element 61, Olivium. And uh, for some time they were supposedly perfectly good uh, elements. And as an interesting thing I thought about that, the question there was, where would you find that? Well, he went to the purchasing agent and told them he wanted five gallons of seawater because he felt that those elements might be in seawater. And uh, he told me one day, the purchasing agent said, uh, well, Fred, do you, want, you really want that much? five gallons. <laughs> and Dr. Ellison said, well, if you think that we can spare it, we'll get it. <laughs> well, I said, well, maybe we can get five gallons. I don't know where it came from. But that was, that was the material he started with for those two elements. And I'm not sure that was a, uh, a good choice, really. But what he was looking for if you take all of the alkaline elements, you know, uh, lithium, sodium, potassium, cesium, and so on, 
and you you plotted those the minima of those and extrapolate if you extrapolate to the right point and look to see if you find a minima there then if you find it you think you've got that element element 87 I think it is and he did that with ever so many of the halogen acids the hydriotic acid hydrochloric and so on you know but uh, that was as far as that went uh, he didn't try to separate anything. He didn't try to purify anything. anything like that. Now, one thing he did do with hydrogen, when they found tritium existed in such very, very small amounts, the question was, where would you expect to find tritium? Well, I think Taylor at Princeton showed that if you just boil water long enough, enough of it over a long enough period you would concentrate a little bit of more of the deuterium so i remember saying to dr ellison well it seems to me the place to look for tritium is to go down to the laundry where they've got a, a steam pressing outfit you know where they're boiling water all the time and get some of that he said well my idea was to go to a dairy where they're steaming bottles. And when he got some of that sample, I don't know whether he got it from the laundry or the dairy, but uh, anyway, he, he could extrapolate them where he thought the tritium would show, and he found there was a, a minimum there. Now, any more than that, he didn't do. But uh, I don't know what he would have done, to really, uh, to do that. Well, he didn't try to isolate it because Mm -hmm. He didn't try to isolate it because oh, the no. chemistry was too difficult uh, for well, Auburn, or what was the... No, no, things, you just didn't do things like that in those days. And um, more than that, uh, he, had, he, he, gave, he sent some papers to the Physical Review, and the people there said, we don't want to publish any more of the visual work. We want you to get that. <coughs> to get that in the, on, uh, on paper. And uh, do it objectively. No more of this visual stuff. So that's Dr. Allison's emphasis then was on that. He quit all the other stuff and did that. So he, he switched to trying to perfect the... That's right. Optical method to measure it after a review yeah. editor said that. Do it photoelectrically or photographically. Well, how did he feel as the credit was taken away for the discovery of these elements? Did he Well, I guess it was, it was taken away. You know, uh, there's a lot of, uh, I thought there was a lot of questionable business at that time. There was a man stopped here one day. And uh, he was a salesman of some, some kind of, of, chemo, of uh, scientific work, products. And when he heard that I was from Illinois, he said, I want to talk to you. He said, I used to be at Oak Ridge. And he said, those people up there simply stole your thunder about element 61, a linear. I said, what do you mean? Well, he said, if you read very carefully the announcement of uh, Promethium, that was the element 61, I think, um, the way they proved that, they went back to the, the spectroscopic data that P.W. Selwood had done at Illinois. He was there when I was there, and I remember when he did that work. He took many, many photographs, spectra, of what we thought was material containing element 61. It's a very complicated spectrum. And he ruled out all of the possible impurities. By spectrum, you mean what kind? Was, this was optical spectroscopy, not x-ray. 
from a very complicated spectrum and uh, claimed that these few spectrum lines belong to element 61. Well, this man told me that those people at Oak Ridge used that data to prove that they had element 61. And I thought, well, how on earth could that be? But that was what was done for Prometheum. Now, these spectra are in Selwood's thesis? The spectra are, yeah, I'm sure they're in his thesis from Illinois. That would have been about 1930, 30, 31. Now, of course, that had nothing to do with Dr. Allison's work. No, but no. still it's another element. That... It's another element, yeah. So I, I really don't know. I thought that Dr. Allison uh, should have had credit on, on uh, deuterium. Not on tritium, but on deuterium. Because he really had an evidence of, of deuterium. But uh, he didn't have any in his hand, and I don't know whether Yuri ever had any in his hand or not. I don't think so. This was all spectroscopic. Taylor would have had a better chance of having deuterium, but that was some time later. Now, did he have the announcement of the two minima in his abstract for the ACS meeting, or did he just present it? No, that's in the that's in the journal, but I'm not sure of the dates. That's in the journal. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's in the physical review or whether it's in the JCS. But he never became bitter about this. Uh, as no, most no. people would be prone to this. <laughs> At one time, he came back from a meeting of the. Um, the uh, what National Academy or one group in Washington, and he said, you know, some of the people on our side were going to have a fight with those people on the other side. I said, Dr. Allison, you're kidding me. No, he said, it really was was pretty much touch and go. He said it was terrible. Said, you know, scientific things aren't settled that way. You don't yell and argue. <laughs> uh, it could have been. Well, I don't know where. I don't know what group it was. It might have been the AAAS or something like that. You know. I just don't know what meeting it was. But I remember him telling me, and being shocked about it. The people would would. There was a man named Slack, who was from Vanderbilt, who was uh, very anti this work, said it just was not, was nothing to it. He had been here, he had tried it, he had seen the minimum, uh, I thought. A lot of people had been here. Dr. Allison never turned anybody away from his lab, never. If you had called him up and said, Fred, I would like to come down and see your apparatus and uh, try it out, and uh, Dr. Allison would have said, well, tell me when you want to come, and come on. That's what he did for me and for Dr. Hopkins. That's what he did for, uh, well, there was a fellow at, uh, at the Weather Bureau remember his name. He was interested in it for some reason. We had people here all the time. We had people that would come and they would say, well now doctor, you know, to prove this thing, you should do some unknowns. And I don't know how many unknowns he did. You mean people would send him mixture? People would come and say, well now to prove this, why don't you just uh, go upstairs and uh, show me where the pure water is and show me this and show me that and I'll fix you up a sample and you come back and tell me what I put in it. And he did that. He 
people would send them things. Two, two laboratories. There was a fella, the name of McGee, up at uh, uh, in Atlanta, not Georgia Tech, but uh, it wasn't Agnes Scott. Oh, I don't remember. I go to school there. Not Emory. 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 That's where it was. Yeah. Doctor McGee. He built this apparatus. Used it. A long time. There were some people at uh, George, at Washington University in St. Louis who did it. And uh, there was Latimer and Young out in California. They did it and gave the thing up. There was, it was, there was no, no question that what they were doing and what seemed to be the right work and everything. But they said it just, it just got too many. Too many minima. They just weren't clean enough. But Dr. Allison, he just worked and worked and worked to have things clean. And that was the reason, that was the, I think, the reason it was successful. Well, now, could you describe his lab when you got, arrived here? When I arrived here? It was in the basement of Sanford Hall, which was the big, the big building on the campus with the bell tower and all that. We had a big lecture room on the first floor. The office had about five or six people in it, the whole staff. Uh, we had a little shop. We had two laboratories for students downstairs in the basement. And we had two large rooms. And the rooms were quite long, a little longer than this, perhaps. But uh, the ceiling had wires along there for these trolleys that, that he had, the wire system. And the table over here in the middle with a string running around uh, to pull the sliding contact along. And it, it worked remarkably well. I mean, it didn't jerk and all of that. And over in the side of the room was all the stills and all of that sort of thing, chemicals. <laughs> and the, the chemicals mainly were out in another room. And a, a bench where he made up all the chemicals and washed stuff and all of that. Uh, you just had these sliding contacts on one end of this apparatus. It was a balanced system, but only one end moved. Our system. May have marked something. Yeah, there was a scale up there that you could read off of. They had a vernier on it. You could read to oh about I would say uh, a couple of millimeters. You you just it, the room had to be dark. You had to sit a, a little bit to to get your eye. Uh, adjusted to low light levels. And after that, there was a man sitting off at the side watching this, this scale. And the fellow operating the apparatus with a wheel to move this, this trolley back and forth. And when he would stop, you would record where he stopped. And when he, uh, if he wasn't satisfied or you weren't satisfied with is seeing what he was saying, uh, why he said, well, try it again. And maybe you would reach up there and move the thing some little distance and then let him try it again. So he really didn't know where he was but that sliding contact. One Saturday afternoon, we had a man here who was real good at electronics. He was... Uh, when he left here, he went back to Oak Ridge and was in charge of all the diagnostic development, apparatus development, for Project Sherwood. Well, he came down, and he'd been interested in this apparatus, and he said, now, we've heard a lot of stories about it working or not working. So I want you and Dr. Allison to come in 
and uh, I'm going to set up the apparatus for you, put in the solution, and you don't know anything about it. And I want you to find the minima that are in there. So now I'll take all the data, and if you stop on the wrong place, I'll put that down. You stop on the right place, I'll put that down. Just, just tell me when you come to a minimum. Well, first I would work, then Dr. Allison would work, then I would work, then Dr. Allison would work. We spent all Saturday afternoon. We never missed once. Not once. <laughs> I remember Ray saying, well, it was just no use in my doing this experiment at all. Did he ever record that? Or? He recorded it all. He took it home. I don't know what he ever did with it. Is he still at Oak Ridge? Or? No. He, he left Oak Ridge. He's out in California now, and I don't know, but I can find out where he is. I can find out where he is. Because he took, he took down that data. His brother-in-law, uh, lives in Auburn. He used to be the head of the journalism department of the school. And his last name was? That's, the man's name was Dandel. Ray Dandel. D-A-N-D-L. I had a big research contract with the Air Force one time. And uh, we were building a strategic warfare computer. If you can imagine such a thing. And Ray came back to Auburn to uh, work on that. And he was there here for a couple of years. He was one of those boys who came from Iowa. Uh, the Army, he was in ROTC. And during the first of the war, the Army came out there and collected a lot of those boys up. And uh, said, we're going to take you somewhere for your, the rest of the war. And they put him in a, a Pullman car, pulled down the blinds, said, don't you raise the blinds, when they got to where they were going. I remember Ray said there were so many pine trees around there, he'd never seen a place like that. They were at Oak Ridge. And for several months, all he did was solder. <laughs> solder this circuit, solder that circuit. He hadn't finished his degree, so he came to Auburn and got the rest of his degree, and we hired him. And then he came back for another contract that we had with the Air Force and uh, got interested in the apparatus. When he went back to Oak Ridge, then they made him the head of the diagnostic apparatus department for that project, Sherwood. But he. Uh, he was there for a number of years, and then he went out to California. He was still out there. Now, how many graduate students would be doing research with Dr. Allison during the thirties? Oh, in that period, we'd be lucky to have one. Yeah, it was very, very small. So it was most one of the men. One of the men who was a graduate student went out to Washington uh, University in St. Louis and did that work out there. His name was Wingert. He died. He came back to Auburn when he got his degree and was in uh, chemical engineering. But uh, we had, we're very fortunate, Dr. Allison very fortunate, in having uh, two people who were in agronomy. They were doing work in the minor elements in agronomy. You know, all the manganese and copper and all that stuff that they use and so on. And uh, they got interested in the apparatus as a means of uh, analyzing some of those samples. And they helped him with the chemistry of that a whole lot before I got here. And even after I got here, well, one retired, went to California from some place out there. I don't think she ever did anything more. One girl married and went up in the Maine somewhere. And uh, I think they built the apparatus, but she had a family and it kind of just uh, 
second <laughs> effort wasn't didn't do anything with it. This was back in the thirties that she went to Maine and built this, or yeah, it was it was later than that. Uh, I think that would have been maybe almost up to the forties. Her name was Bishop before she got married. I don't remember what her name was after that. And this Bishop. And how did he you know, we're talking about things way well, I, back there. I understand. <laughs> you, you're doing exceptionally well. Some of these things are uh, kind of hard to remember. I, I can't even remember names from yesterday. <laughs> uh, how did he support his research during the 30s and the Depression? Oh, it was difficult. It was difficult. Um, many of the things that we used were made. We made them. We had a little shop, and uh, I made a lot of things. He made a lot of things. We had an old lathe. We had a drill press. We had a little milling machine and uh, a table saw and the rest hand tools. And uh, the old lathe was old enough, so it was one of those that had been run with steam, and they'd converted it to electricity, you know, to electric motor. Uh, the drill press was a table drill press. It had been brought over by the man who had been the head of the physics department before Dr. Allison, but had moved over to head of head electrical engineering. The thing set up on a table, and you reached under the table and uh, pulled the switch, a 220 switch. <laughs> you couldn't even see it. You just reached under there and, and closed it to make the thing go. And I remember one time uh, it got me, and I said, well, I've had enough of that. So I made a little foot switch to go on the floor. And then Dr. Dunstan, Professor Dunstan, came over to use the drill press, and he really cussed me out for taking that switch off of there, because he couldn't find it, and I showed it to him. He was very happy after that. I don't know how many times he'd gotten it. But uh, with that, that much equipment, we made all kinds of things. We really, really did. But I've made stuff all my life. It's uh, it wasn't any wasn't any great business. When I did uh, Ray Patterson and University of Dayton get the extensive drawings of his apparatus so that they could construct one there, or at Wright Patterson, mm -hmm. that man. Let me think what his name was. Um, Yes, they were down here. That man who worked there on this thing was a student here, an undergraduate student. Uh, do you remember his name? Did you ever see any publications? Uh, yes, sir. He got a big publication. Then there are two uh, Air Force reports on it yeah. that I have. Well, was there a name with it? I, I thought McPherson or McPherson or... Max something, wasn't it? I don't remember. That fellow lived just up the road in, uh, in uh, oh, not West Point, but one of those textile towns up there. Folks lived there. Um, I can't remember that man's name. Well, he, I don't know, I don't think he was ever a graduate student with us. He worked for Dr. Allison a lot. And he may have been a graduate student. I don't know. Um, I had, I, when I had the Air, first Air Force contract, uh, I just got away from all of that. I had about 20 people working for me, and uh, we had a, for five years to build the thing, to build two computers for them. And, uh, so I, I kind of got away, and he was here at that time. But we were in a different part of the building. This, this contract was uh, 
confidential, and uh, so they put us up in the end of the building where we were disturbed. Well, does his original apparatus still exist, or has it been dismantled? No, no. You see, the first apparatus was in Sanford Hall. Then we moved to what they call the new classroom building, and that's called Thatch Hall now. We were in the nice room there in the basement, in big air conditioning. Um, we had a separate room for the stills. It was a very nice setup. Well, we outgrew that building. And we built the building where the physics department is now. But we didn't have a room of the right shape, you know, the right dimensions. It wasn't long enough as a trouble. And that apparatus worked, but it didn't, I, didn't, I never felt that that apparatus was, was as good as the one that we had had in the second building. Or the first building, even. you needed a room that was about 40 feet long for this wire system. You didn't want to run the wires parallel, close to each other. If I put my hands out, does it show? Uh, you just didn't want to, to have the thing jammed up because you had a lot of high voltage. You wanted it up so that somebody tall wasn't running into it. And uh, you wanted it dry. Well, the last building we moved into was difficult to get dry. You mean low humidity? Low, low humidity, yes. It was difficult. The best time that ap apparatus worked was in the spring, like long now. The humidity will run way down for Oh, several days before we get a storm again. We get a lot of high pressure area around here. The humidity runs down. It's very good, but in the summertime, it's, it's pretty difficult. You ask about how did we support things? Well, Dr. Allison found some butcher shop who was getting a new air conditioning unit for their, their butcher shop. And what did he do? He brought bought the old one for about $50, just the compressor and the evaporator, brought it over to the lab, and we air conditioned part of that building, part of the room. At one time, we wanted to get some air pressure in the lab, and we had an air compressor in the shop, but we didn't have any pipes over in the lab. So it was the summertime, and I said, well, Dr. Allison, nobody's using the gas. Why don't, we, why don't we just blow out the gas line and connect the thing to the gas line? Well, he said, that ought to do it. So we did it. We ran our experiment. And then one day, an old lady came to the door of the office. Where is that Hughes? And I said, well, I'm right here, Miss Alley. She was the... She was the treasurer. She said, I want you to come over to my office. I said, okay. She said, that gas heater, when I turned it on, it just about exploded. And I want to know why. I said, Miss Allen, we were using that for experimental work, and I forgot to let the pressure down. <laughs> She was boiling mad. She said, if you ever try a stunt like that again, you will never get another check from this university. So that's the way we did things. I don't know. I, I've had a good time around here from the day we got here. Of course, I just got married. We came down here. The first thing, about the first week or so after we got here, they had a reception for all the faculty. We had about two or three hundred people over on the president's lawn. The uh, executive secretary introduced my wife and me to everybody here. Everybody was so gracious and pleasant, and nobody had any money. <laughs> they just didn't pay salaries for two or three months around here. It was the depression, and it was real bad. How large was the university at that time? 
I think they had about 1,400 students. And the city itself? Oh, the city might have had, uh, oh, five, six thousand people. And Not was more than was there the sports rivalry then that there is now, or the sports? With, yes, with Alabama. Uh, yes, yes, sports. Football was a big thing. Not baseball. Not tennis. They didn't even have a tennis court, I don't think, for the fact for the varsity. They didn't have a varsity team. Uh, they had uh, basketball, they had swimming, they had an old gym, and uh, they had a basketball team, they had a football team, they had a track team. Coach Hustle was the track coach, he was very good. And uh, oh, they had cross country, they had all that kind of thing. I never had any interest much in that, but it was there. And but you enjoyed playing tennis? Mm -hmm. You, you played tennis yourself? Oh yeah, we played tennis. Uh, Dr. Allison had this court practically alongside of his house. And uh, he liked to play tennis. I liked to play tennis. I used to play all the time. But uh, not as a graduate student. I got to be a graduate student. We had a man in the department who was experimenting with chrome plating. Chrome plating wasn't known at that time. You can imagine such a thing. And uh, one day, Dr. Kramers was his name, he said to me, uh, you want me to, uh, to chrome plate your golf clubs? I said, well, tell me something about it. Well, he says, I do it with chromic acid, hot sulfuric chromic acid. Uh, gives them a good shine. If you do it cold, it comes out black, I think it was. I think that's what he says, one or the other. And I said, well, if you put my golf clubs in there and they dissolve, then what? I had bought these clubs. I got four clubs in the bag and two balls, I don't know what, uh, for five dollars. <laughs> that was big stuff. So uh, he said, no, they won't dissolve. So I had one of the first chromium plated golf club sets you ever saw. Of course, there were an awful lot of pinholes <laughs> in the chromium plate, but uh, Dr. Kramer used to play golf with us at Illinois. Out on the, they had a little nine-hole course out there. It cost nine cents to play all afternoon, and uh, it was alongside the orchard, the university orchard, so that generally you could, you could get an apple or two. <laughs> It was a nice way to spend the afternoon and go work until midnight in the lab. Now, how much did graduate students get a month as a stipend? Uh, when I started, I got $40 a month. And the next year, I got 50 And the next year, I got 60 And then when I got my degree, I got $200 a month. Well, the fellowship. So I was living high then. But the first and second year, my folks had to give me a little little help. And I remember that uh, all the graduate students were in the same boat. Nobody had much money. We would go downtown in Champaign, Illinois to a Greek restaurant and have an omelet for Sunday night supper. That was the big event, <laughs> getting an omelet. <laughs> but when I finally got my degree, we used to eat at the uh, university club, which was entirely different, and it was very fine. On $200 a month, and you know, I didn't have too much. I had a car. I paid $100 for the first car I got. A pretty good little Ford. Now, did you drive it to Auburn? Or? That, yeah, I drove that down here, and I rode, drove it around here quite a long time. Uh, we used to have a little dog, and the dog would uh, get in the car. It was just a little two-seater Ford Roadster. The dog would get in the car, and when I would start home, he'd hop out, and he'd chase me all the way home. And all my students would be yelling, hey, Fess, why don't you give the dog a lift? <laughs> but I used to park the car back in Sanford Hall on a little hill there. And uh, one day, Dr. Duncan, the president of Auburn at that time, said, uh, 
Dr. Hughes, I wonder if you'd park your car someplace else. My battery is down and I want to use the hill for a week. <laughs> so you see, Auburn was quite a, quite a different place than it is today. But was, we've had wonderful times here. And how large was the physics department at that time? We had Dr. Allison. We had Dr. Arnquist. We had uh, Mr. Gosland. We had Mr. Waldo and myself. That was it. Then we lost Arnquist. can't remember uh, who took his place, if anybody did. I'm not sure. And if you had graduate students, who taught you had to teach traditional courses for that? Or? Well, we had so few graduate students that it was just a, almost a personal relationship, mm -hmm. you know. It was more like a seminar relationship, a reading seminar or something like that. And, uh, but the graduate program was, the graduate program really didn't start uh, with physics, I guess until 41 or 42, 43, somewhere along in there. Maybe, well, maybe as late as 45. When Dr. Ellison became the dean of the graduate school, uh, he pushed that a little bit, the graduate program. And now physics here has, oh, I don't know, I guess they've got about 40 or 50 graduate students, something like that. Now what was a normal teaching load when you came? When I came, we were on a semester system. We had three lectures a week. I had two courses, and uh, three afternoons a week I was in the laboratory with students. Um, we had help at that time to grade laboratory reports. and. I think that was about the load that we were carrying at that time. But I would have to, at least two lectures a day, Monday, Wednesday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And Thursdays, and I remember Thursdays was a day when you worked problems for students and answered questions and all that sort of thing. Then they went on the quarter system and that way, I used to have three lectures and uh, two laboratories a week, one advanced or maybe two advanced. Optics, that was my interest, spectroscopy. Oh, it's different now. But you have described Professor Allison as one who didn't easily get upset um, what were some of the other characteristics of him and his interactions with associates? They couldn't have been better. They couldn't have been better. The only time that Dr. Allison ever did anything that he didn't ask approval of, or I don't mean that, he didn't ask approval. But we were in a staff meeting one day and something came up and um, he said that we were going to do that that way whatever it was i don't know and i said to him well dr allison we didn't take a vote on that he said well that's the subject that we never take a vote on and that was that and we all accepted it there was no argument no nothing like that a very easygoing man, but uh, he had a lot of good ideas. I remember a meeting that we had when Auburn University was, when they changed from Alabama Polytechnic Institute to Auburn University. 
they had a meeting one afternoon, and I think it ran till about 7 o'clock at night, and people were getting pretty edgy. And twice, Dr. Allison rose to speak, and it made good sense, and it, it, it finally settled the argument. I don't remember what his argument was for changing it, but it finally settled it. He was the one who made the suggestion, I remember that. He was very, very practical. Um, I remember him telling me one time about giving an exam in electricity and magnetism. And they had used a book, I can't remember the name of the book, but the book was just one circuit derivation after another. It was just deriving this, that, and the thing, the next thing, right straight through the book. And I said, I don't know how on earth you're going to give an exam on that. Well, he said, I'm going to uh, make out a lot of questions. I'm going to talk them over with the students. I'm going to discuss these questions with the students, see if they think they're fair. I said, what do you do after that? Well, he said, I'm going to write them all out and put them in a hat. And I'm going to let the students pull out ten questions. And that's what they're going to get. He said, I'll write them on the board as they pull them out. And that was it. And how did the students like that? Huh? How did the students react? Well, apparently it was all right. <laughs> no, he never had any trouble with students. And the door was never closed to his office. Never. That was one thing we never did. There were never any closed doors in the physics department. If a student had any kind of a question at all, he was, Dr. Allison would spend any amount of time with him. And he was always very helpful to these boys. I remember one student was just, just hopeless. And uh, there was a rule that a senior could take a final exam a second time if uh, he was about to graduate. You know, if that was the one thing that was going to hold him up. And we had a case like that. And the boy took his second exam and failed it. And he came in the office. And Dr. Allison had said to me, he said, I just don't know what we're going to do. That's a nice boy, and I don't think physics ought to hold him up like that. And the boy came in, and Dr. Allison looked at him, and he said, Well, I thought you'd do better on part one of that exam. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess he did well on the second part. The second part was better. <laughs> That's right. Well, it sounds like he was a practical person anyway. Oh, he was. He was very practical. He was very practical. And, and he got to know the students quite well? Or? Um, well, yes and no, but I would say more no than yes. He wasn't, he wasn't uh, standoffish at all. He wasn't that. Uh, but he was... When he wasn't with the students, working with them, he was down in that lab, working with that apparatus. That man, he worked there Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon. He did go to church Sunday, but the rest of the time on Sunday, he was working in that lab. I think I spent more Saturdays over there uh, working with him than I spent doing anything else. I really did. It just, it was, Sunday afternoon, he and Miss Allison would call on their various friends. But uh, I think Sunday evening, he'd probably be over in the lab again. He, he really was a worker. Now, uh, wh what were the other areas that he pursued with the magneto-optic? Uh, discovering isotopes is one, but if he worked so many hours... Well, he was interested at one time in working with a man in England on uh, calcium. This fellow was a geologist of some kind, 
and uh, they did quite a thing with, with uh, calcium. Uh, but that ended when Dr. Allison was just wanted to pursue the one thing of the apparatus. He worked quite a while with Dr. Piggott at uh, Carnegie uh, Foundation. Dr. Piggott was interested in lead isotopes, and uh, he worked with him on that for quite a long time. And he worked with this man at Emory quite a long time. Uh, and I don't remember just what they were interested in. But uh, his main interests, uh, his main interest after I got here was in getting the, the scale readings for more compounds. Uh, see, I got here just about the time they had done the work, uh, they had already done the work on hydrogen and deuterium. They were just finishing up the work on elements 85 and 87. And Dr. Allison was really worrying about doing unknowns and things like that and having guests here to look at the apparatus to see if they could use it and all of that sort of thing. And then, to be told that they would not accept further visual work, that turned him away from all these other interests to just the one of trying to get the thing on, uh, on paper. And of course, he retired in there sometime. Let me see. I can't remember which year he retired. But that took him away, of course, from the campus, first up to uh, Emory and Henry and then to Thailand. But when he taught in Huntington, it wasn't a bit unusual that he would come here for any little vacation from that school and work. Well, now, uh, it's unusual for a editor to say that's all he's going to accept with visual reading. I think uh, if you look in the archives, you may find that letter. You may find his correspondence on that. Now, it's a very unfortunate thing. When Dr. Allison became dean of the graduate school, of course, all of his correspondence from that point on was in the graduate office. The secretaries did the work, not the physics department. And for a while there, he was not only the graduate dean, he was head of the physics department, but his office really wasn't in the physics department. Uh, Dr. Parker, when Dr. Allison retired, Dr. Parker came in, and the first thing he said was, all of this stuff in these files has got to be cleaned out. And they threw it all away. Mrs. Allison told me that a half dozen times. You know that lady is still living here. I didn't realize. Yes, she lives She lives out in Wesley Terrace, a retirement home. She's very frail. She's 94 or 5 now. Um, but she's... She's a delightful, was a delightful person. Now she's very hard of hearing. It's difficult to uh, engage her in conversation. And her memory is, you know, not yeah. all. Well, now, did the editor get complaints that he was acting on complaints, or was just this uh, personal? I have no idea. I don't know. But I remember Dr. Allison telling me about that, but I never read the letter. And uh, did he try to fight this, or he, did he, he just try to win? did? Did he engage in debate with the editor over this? No, I don't know that either. Except I don't know. Well, if a person had just discovered two elements, uh, that would get most people excited. Uh, well, it? yes, yes, it would should. But, you know, those two elements are 
this was along about the time when people were doing a lot of work at Oak Ridge and making uh, radioactive materials, you know. And uh, they had some theories at that time. The man, the fella at uh, Purdue who did a lot of that work, uh, was saying that element 61 couldn't be and that elements 85 and 87 could be. You would never find them in nature. And, uh, well, a lot of people are arguing on the other side against Dr. Allison's discovery. Do you think it takes a special technique to be able to operate this instrument, or can most people... Uh, patience. Patience. Uh, I say patience because you sit there in the dark. You've got somebody sitting over on the side watching the trolley. You're looking at a little, oh, maybe eighth inch, three sixteenths inch diameter blue circle of light. And it's fluttering because it's a spark light. And uh, you move the trolley slowly and cross the places. You First you calibrate the machine. You put the same liquid in each coil. And you set the thing, so that should give you uh, the, the calibration. And then all of the data that you take after that would be equivalent to be equal to the data that Dr. Allison got, point after point, you come to the same place. And after you do that for a little while, you I tell you, when you do it, your, your head could wander around. Dr. Allison always had a thing to lean his head against. <laughs> so that you would be looking at that all the time. And uh, you get tired. You get tired looking that way. And supposing, supposing things don't work, well, uh, you've forgotten to hook up something. And that's pretty common doesn't work. Then you wonder what on earth is the matter. Or maybe the spark is too sputtery. Then you get everything fixed and try it again and try it again. You just have to learn to do it. It's not easy. There's no question about it. And how long would it take to make a measurement of a sample that had, let's say, 10 compounds in it that you didn't know what it was? Well, if you had an idea, supposing instead of saying, uh, what's in there, you say, well now here, here are the possibilities. Mm -hmm. So you would set the trolley, the sliding contact, you would set it about that far, on either side, one time, one side, another time, another side, a little farther, a little farther, a little closer, whatever. And you say, now move towards you or move away, so he's not wandering around the end of the trolley, you know. And the fellow stops on that thing. You say, well, uh, I'll write that down. Now, let's move back here. You reach up there and pull the thing back. He doesn't know how far you pulled it back. All he's got is a little wheel up here with a string on it. Um, let's try it again. And if he hits that two or three times, you say, well, you hit that three times. You didn't go someplace else. You hit that spot. And that says that that's copper. So we'll assume you got copper. Now, here's another one. I'll try that one. And you could cross them off that way. And then, before you give up on it, you should take the sample, pour it out, rinse it out, rinse it out, rinse it out, rinse it out and put it up there again and look again. Say now, you see anything in this place? Or dilute it 10 times. You know, just take a 10 cc pipette and 100 cc of water and dilute it. And then say, try it again now, we'll see if it's still there. And that's the way, just by dilution, was the way he gave a quantitative idea of these things. 
But by the time you get down to one part, 10 to the 11, somewhere along in there, the thing disappears. That was the thing that got me, was how it could be so sensitive. And I still don't understand that. How it could be that sensitive, but that's what it was. Now, is this something that the fluttering arc could be replaced by a laser with? Or? Is well, we didn't have question? lasers in those days. No, but now, today, okay. if one were going to... You might. You might. I can think of a lot of experiments that we should have done, and a lot more that we could do today if we were back in the business. I thought for a while I would, I would get back to it, but uh, I've had some eye trouble lately, and that's that. I, I just don't see well. Well, what are some of the things you should have done? Well, let me think what was the other I was thinking of the other day. One of the things I would like to do is to take all that data that he had, it's all over there in the library, in the archives, and uh, look at it very carefully with respect to the number of isotopes, with respect to the, uh, uh, what the difference in scale reading is for the isotopes. Uh, with, I think I would like to, well, I'd like to try some of the lasers too, but the things that we might have done, we never, we never tried to get the resolving power of the thing. It, it's, it's small because isotopes are close together. And what he had, he had two wires and he had a contact across there. So when he moved the contact a centimeter, it shortened that wire path two centimeters. And uh, some of his minima on the thing are about that far apart. I mean, they really were about that far apart as far as a straight wire or a straight beam of light. Is concerned. We did one experiment one time I thought was very interesting. The question was, uh, it, the spark source as a source of light, how long does that light last? Supposing I had a mirror out there 100 feet or so, and I take the spark light and run it out there and then back into the machine, would it get back there too late for the magnetic fields to operate? Well, we, we did that experiment, and uh, it can be too late. You get out about 40 feet, and things begin to change, and you, you don't get minima. Uh, oh, what else was I thinking about? But the resolving power was one thing. I was thinking about it the other day. Oh, another thing, when you put a compound in water, and all these solutions were water solutions, aqueous solutions, uh, maybe some of those minima are, are complex compounds. Suppose you take aluminum chloride and put it in water. How do we know it's not aluminum oxychloride or something like that? Uh, if the number of isotopes doesn't match what the number of isotopes ought to be, is there a chance it's some other complex compound? So when you dilute the thing down, well, you, you think you've diluted it down, but you still have two compounds there in the, in the sample. I would think you could get at that from, uh, I don't know whether microwave spectroscopy works too well in liquids or not. I think it'd be pretty poor, but I don't know. They're just all these things, you know, you think about them and wonder if you, well, why we didn't think of that at the time. 
Well, what was it that attracted you to physics and science in the first place? A high school teacher, I guess. I had a good high school teacher, a guy by the name of Baker. Uh, I I had a good memory for the names and the and the uh, symbols for all the elements of the periodic table for some reason or other. He wanted me to be his assistant. He uh, took me down to Oberlin and showed me around the lab there through the chemistry department and. Um, it just looked like the, the most interesting thing I'd seen, I guess. And I've done a lot of things around here. That the last thing we did here, I built a ruling engine to rule diffraction gratings. And <laughs> it was quite a job. The fourth one that I made uh, worked. Um, we had a, a question. A question came up a long time ago. The Smith Purcell effect. I don't know if you ever heard of that. Well, in a in a uh, in microwaves, you can generate them with a magnetron, or you can generate them with a klystron. And a magnetron, you have a wire going down in a little copper uh, cylinder. And in this little copper cylinder, you have some slots at the side. And uh, if you heat the wire, get electrons, all things evacuate, um, and put a big magnetic field on it, the electrons coming off the wire circle around in front of these little slots. It goes very fast, of course, and you get microwaves. Now, if you take that copper piece and cut it and lay it out flat, and have a wire, have electrons going along that way, works just the same way, only they changed the name, they called it a, a backward wave tube. Why, I don't know. I never knew why they called it that. But, if instead of having the little slots so far apart to get waves, say, that long, uh, suppose you make them thinner and finer and finer and finer. You send an electron across them real fast maybe half the speed of light. If you get them fine enough, instead of getting the microwave off of there, you get an optical wave, visual wave, visible wave. You can generate light that way. And that's the only way that I know of you can generate light in a non-quantized manner. All the others come from quantum shifts in, in atoms. Or the the microwaves and atoms, you know, when the molecule spins around, does that sort of thing. So I said to uh, Dr. Allison, among others, why don't we make a ruling engine to rule these grooves very close together and send that electron across there and see if we get the light? Because supposing I put the little grooves uh, a half a wavelength apart, a wavelength of light. Say we use the green where you're more sensitive. And if it's a half wavelength, and then I send an electron down there at the half the speed of light, I should get green light coming out there. <laughs> so I, I worked a long time to make a ruling engine. I called up Bosch and Long one time and asked them if they would rule me some gratings. And the man said, well, yeah, they rule gratings. Uh, how big a grating, how many grooves? I said, well, we need about a thousand grooves. Oh, he said, we never do that. Uh, it takes us two weeks to set up the machine. Well, I said that wasn't quite what I wanted. I first I wanted a thousand grooves, and then I wanted one of five hundred and one of two fifty. Oh, he said, I'm sorry, but you're talking to the wrong people. 
So I said, well, I'll have to make the ruling engine myself then, I guess. And he said, well, I've heard that before, so good luck. <laughs> and that was the end of that conversation. I finally got a ruling engine that just was perfect. We uh, could rule little grooves about all that long. And we could make them a half a wave of blue light uh, apart. And we could rule as many as a thousand. Well, um, the question then developed, this had been done before, but the question developed was, if you see the blue light, supposing we rule fewer and fewer, how many does it take before you don't see any light? Because you're supposed, to, before you can see any light, you're supposed to get a whole panel, aren't you? Well, from the theory of that thing, here is an electron going across these grooves. And, of course, the electron over the metal, that was metal, metal ruling, uh, electron above the metal, you would have what amounts to a reflected image in the metal, wouldn't it? So that when you go across this piece and then down the valley of the next piece, the, the reflected and the electron would be farther apart and you would get that sort of a, of a motion of the electron, of the electric field, which would give you uh, light that oscillating uh, dipole. And you can calculate back how many grooves it took to get a quantum of blue light or green light, whatever you were using, whatever you were doing. So uh, we calculated it take a thousand grooves. That's why I wanted a thousand. <laughs> well, we got, we got green light with a thousand grooves. So then we went back and ruled 500. Well, we got green light with 500. We got 250. Well, it wasn't quite so green, but it was light. It was more white, whitish green. I mean, it was pale green, but it was light. And we went half of that, half of that, half of that. We got down to five grooves. You could see that. You could see that all right. So. We got thinking about the thing. It didn't sound right. Well, the light was polarized, as it should have been, because you've got this thing, you know, not that thing, not every direction. And uh, then somebody in France said that uh, when they had a thing like that, and the electron came at an angle, if they changed the angle, the color changed. So I said to Ernest, my graduate student one day, uh, let's do that. Let's change the angle. But let's don't have too many of these grooves. If I change the angle, if we're too far away from the first groove, it's the same thing as having fewer grooves. So we can calculate from just the color at, and the angle and the number of grooves how close the electron has to be before it's effective. Well, we did that. All visual work, all looking at it. And he was writing up the paper to send to the physical review. And what did they get back? What did he get back? It's a very interesting paper, but until you can get it photographically, we can't accept it. <laughs> you know, that wasn't over 10 years ago. I retired in 1970, and that must have been about 74 or 5. Has anyone done it photographically since then, or is it still? No, I said, Ernest. I just can't believe we're going through this again. 
So I'll tell you what I'll do. I will build a little uh, grading spectrograph that will mount. We were using an old electron microscope as the source of the high voltage. Mm -hmm. And uh, is that lady up there? Oh, she's from up the street. I won't worry about that. She just, I got a greenhouse full of flowers back oh. there. Uh, I said, I'll build this little uh, spect spect uh, spectrograph that will fasten right on the electron microscope. And you can swing it to the side and see that everything is going. Swing it back and photograph. And he photographed it. And they accepted the thing without any comment at all. He just took it. That was that. And he got his degree and left. And he didn't leave. Like, you know, a guy doing a thing like that, what kind of a job is he prepared for? <laughs> I don't know. So a fellow came by here one day that I'd had as a student, and I'd been a colleague too, and was telling me about measuring swells in the ocean. He was working for NOAA. And uh, <laughs> he said he could measure a swell of about six inches change in the water depth of the ocean. Uh, that would take about two minutes. And he thought that was just doing wonderful. But he said, I don't know which way they're moving. I said, well, Kenneth, uh, Kenneth Steele. Uh, I, it, there's no question about which way they're moving or finding out which way they're moving. Because you've got a stick out there in the ocean sticking right down in the, through the water. He said, not where I am. I said, yes, you have. you got the Earth's magnetic field. He's going down there. I said, why don't you just measure this, this big buoy thing he had, a big flat pancake-like thing. Just measure that relative to the Earth's magnetic field. He said, well, if you're so smart, just write that up as a contract, and I'll sign it. <laughs> So I said, well, let me think about it a little bit, because we had just had one where I had a lot of thinking to do. <laughs> so in a month or two, I figured that we could do that. I'd build them some magnetometers, because when I went to work for the Navy, it was in magnetic fields, so I knew a little about that. And uh, he signed the contract. <laughs> I said, Ernest, this is the graduate student with no job. I said, now I got a, we got a contract here. Would you like to be the investigator? Oh yeah. And he was married, had two children, we needed a job. So I got our department head to be the administrator and I was a consultant because I'd retired. I couldn't do any of that for sure. So we made the magnetometers and showed that you could measure the earth field there, slight tilts and all of that. And uh, they liked that very much. They wanted another contract for a year. So uh, he signed that. And the third year, he wanted, they wanted, he wanted to get another contract. And they said, no, I want you to pack up all your stuff and bring it down here to the Gulf where they their lab is, and uh, join us uh, permanently. So he packed up everything, moved down there, and he had a permanent job. It was a good job. It was the best graduate student I ever had. And was, how many years ago was this? Well, I really don't know. I think he got his degree 75, 74, 76, somewhere along. Dr. Ernest Burdett, he, uh, he was with Noah for about two or three or four years. Then he decided to start his own business. And uh, that scheme of measuring the Earth's magnetic field out in the middle of the ocean was as simple as could be with a magnetometer. And uh, they were very successful at it. And he does all of the analytical work now 
for NOAA on that kind of a project. And they build magnetic devices of all kinds, this little company. Well, I was very happy for him. But I, he didn't, his training in optics of uh, generating waves wasn't exactly the thing that you would uh, sell to some <laughs> General Electric or somebody, I didn't think. And yet, um, the people at uh, Sandia were very much interested in that. Still are. Well, are you still active, or are you just going to school no, out of the no, office? No. I gave up my office. I still have a key to the shop over there. But I gave up the office. And, uh, they needed the space. I had I had a big lab, four dark rooms, a big office, another lab, and I just gave them up one at a time. Finally, I gave up the office because they needed the space. And, I was there. and I, finally, I was just going over there reading the newspaper. Uh, a contract with the people at uh, the Ballistic Missile Center up at Huntsville. Uh, we've heard here last summer about all of the the little tow missiles that they sent the Iranians. You remember? Yes. Well, we worked on the tow missile. In the back of the tow missile, there was a little source of light, uh, and the people who fire the thing uh, watch the target, and the little light in the back is also picked up by the man who is, is firing it. And between the two of them, they guide the missile because there are two wires that come out of the back of that missile. I don't know if you ever heard of that. It's an old, it's an old scheme the French developed. Yeah. The little light bulb back there was a little xenon lamp. It was about, oh, about that big size of your finger. There are two electrodes in there and a little wire across between them. And when you lit that, uh, the wire fused and then it made an arc in the xenon. And uh, when the thing hit something, why of course it was all hell on it. Was, you, you wasted the whole thing. The question was, if you make this little light bulb, say five years before you use it, will it have the xenon in it? And uh, they didn't know. They found a lot of them didn't have any xenon, so they wouldn't look. And of course, if you, if you ever lit the thing and looked at it spectroscopically to see if the xenon was in there, you couldn't light it again if the little wire abused. So how could you detect the xenon in the thing? But what we were going to do was to put in a little radioactive gas, a little radon. And uh, so we signed a contract to do that. <laughs> and after we'd signed the contract, they called us and said, uh, we're sorry, but we aren't going to introduce any nuclear material into the battlefield. <laughs> and so we had the contract. I told them we could do that. Yeah, we could do that. Well, then, how could we do it? Did I ever sweat? I don't know how many afternoons I sat over there in that lab, wondering how on earth to do that. And I finally realized that the xenon, uh, the pressure in there of the xenon, you could, you could tell if there was something in there, if you could measure its index of refraction. And how to do that in a little round tube? Because the, the geometrical optics for that round surface were just almost impossible. And I was sitting over there one afternoon, and I finally thought, well, my gosh, it's round this way, but it's flat this way. <laughs> so I got a laser, and um, joined the, the quartz tube, it was a quartz tube, joined the quartz tube optically so it didn't have any effect, and then brought the laser down 
at, at a variable angle and got the reflected beam coming up. And there, you could show that the reflected beam would change in intensity as you change the angle, depending on the pressure of the xenon. <laughs> the whole thing right there. So we built a little device to mount the thing. And it was about that long, except the little tube right here. This laser was over here, swing it around, reflect the beam up on the wall. And you just watch it, move the thing around, look at the table, tell what the pressure was. We took it to Huntsville. And, uh, well, there's a lot, of, a lot of Auburn students up there that I'd had. And we were standing around talking with a lot of them there, drinking coffee. Well, now, you know, there's somebody from Auburn coming up there. They wanted to get around and talk. Oh. The man who was administering the contract was with me. And there was a high school boy there, and he said, come over here, son, I'll show you how to do this, and you do it and take all the data. And they had a lot of these tubes where the, they had measured the pressure, knew what it was. So this little high school kid, a GS5, I think, or something like that, did all the experimental work while I was off the side talking. And it came out perfectly good. I thought, boy, that was pretty close. I darn near didn't do it, <laughs> but uh, it was a lot of fun after I'd figured out how to do it. Well, what do you think, uh, or, or what was the thing you're proudest of that you did with Allison? What was the one? thing that you had the most pleasure out of that you think is the most significant thing that you did with Allison? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I built him more devices, circuits, optical devices, photographic devices, some of which would work well, some of which they didn't give the, the answer that we were looking for. You would get you would get things working, and you would think that they would uh, they would give you the right answer, but they were not consistent. And if they weren't consistent, you know, that's the test. That's the test. But you got to do that every time, and it didn't. But I've had a lot of, lot of uh, ideas from time to time, and forget them, and get more about things we should have done. We did do one thing one time, which I was rather pleased with, but uh, it wasn't consistent over a long time. It was a long job to do it. We had a camera to photograph, and then I had built a spec. A, a, photometer to measure the density of the thing, the density of the exposure. And we took uh, a picture with the trolley moving and the camera moving along at the same rate that the trolley was moving. And um, we did that five times. And then took the curves from the photometer of those exposures and added them up section by section. And I averaged the thing over. See, to get around the effect of a varying spark, I figured if we did that enough times, we would kind of cancel out the spark. Well, uh, we got some, some fair results from that, but not consistent. And you know, kind of, that's a long job. That's a, an awfully long job. And I had tried to make cameras that would uh, 
move at a constant speed, uh, that's very difficult. I had one camera where I had a good screw and uh, a synchronous motor uh, with, with reducing gears on it, all good gears. And um, we had, even on that one, we had a compensating nut so that when we made a first test, could find that the thing was moving along and stopping and slowing down. You know, there was a drunk screw. Mm -hmm. uh, I could take out the drunkenness by turning the nut back and forward like uh, R.W. Wood did on his ruling engine. And, uh, well, that, that gave us a pretty constant thing, but then the spark was, was fluttering. Now today, you could set up an interferometer and uh, set up a feedback to the motor driving the thing so that you could get a perfectly uniform motion within, you know, wavelengths of light, that rate, uh, a constant rate using the wavelength of light from the interferometer to, to uh, measure spacing sampling. I don't know. I really don't know what Dr. Allison, what you could do with the thing now. And I've thought many times about would it be worthwhile to do it? Because uh, is the room getting too dark? No. Uh, would it be worthwhile to do it? Because, you know, uh, uh, chromatography is so sensitive. Do you ever use that in your work? How sensitive is it? Uh, you can certainly get down to 10 to the 9th. 10 to the minus 9. Well, See, you're almost down there where he was saying. A hundred more would, would do it. And <laughs> chromatography is a lot simpler than what I'm talking about. Don't you think? Don't you think? Well, I, yes, there's been a lot of advances, but uh, why wouldn't his, in theory at least, if it was that sensitive then, why? with improved uh, light Modern source things. Yeah. It might. It might. I wouldn't be surprised when I think of of that apparatus and the, the what the way it works. There are some things that stand out. The first one is that individual compounds do not influence other compounds present. Does that mean that you're dealing with something like a spectrum? That would be the first thing that I would think about. The next thing I think I'd think about is what, what part of the spectrum are we talking about? Well, if minima, if the closest minima are that far apart, the resolving power has to be that. And that means if this is a wave effect, the wave has to be about that size or smaller. Because you can't, you can't resolve uh, with a big wave some little tiny distance. So we're talking about something down in the microwave or the near microwave region, if that's the closeness of the minimum. I think that somebody needs to uh, look at this thing from a strictly analytical point of view. Uh, 
paper and pencil rather than nuts and bolts. Because I'm sure that with all the data that he took, there must be an answer somewhere to, uh, to that thing. And maybe the answer, uh, a theoretical study, an analytical study, would tell you what you're dealing with as distinct from what he was dealing with that gives you the same operation on the, on the sample. Maybe some kind of spectroscopy would, uh, would do the same thing he was doing and do it easier. See, when he got into that, he got into it as a, um, an experiment to do something else and then found this effect and went on from there. If he had, if somebody had said, well, doctor, there must be some other kind of spectroscopy somewhere that will do this thing, he probably would have started off looking at different types of spectroscopy. Mm -hmm. But the one thing that sticks in my mind is that, that that effect of being unique for a compound and not being cluttered up by some other material that's present. That, uh, that must be part of the answer. Well, now, what type of relationship did you two have in your working relationship? Oh, the best. Generally, when I'd get there in the morning, he'd have some new story to tell me that, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Um, I don't know who's going to watch this, but he was telling me one time, he used to have a man who lived with him, who was a, in the extension service, ag extension service, and traveled the whole state. And you know what, he, he picked up one story after another. But he came in one morning and he said, did you hear about the cat that had dysentery? And I said, no, I didn't hear that. He said, yeah, he had three cats working for him. I said, what? He said, yeah, he had one digging and one cover. <laughs> I said, well, what was the third one doing? He said he was out looking for more property. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, to start off the day like that, <laughs> it's going to be a good day. <laughs> no matter how the research comes out, it would be a good day. But Dr. Allison was a great person, I thought. He was fine in every respect. What led him to give up research if he enjoyed it that much to become an administrator? Uh, the president. Oh. Dr. Allison, we need you as the dean. And to push the graduate program. And that was that. I know what that means because my son uh, taught for a long time and the people at Washington and Lee said we need a department head and you were it. And he didn't want that and he's counting the days until he's out. <laughs> but Dr. Allison likes students. He likes students, like young people. They had two children. One was a physician, a boy. He was the head of internal medicine at LSU Medical School. He was the last physician. He's retired now. In fact, is he lives in Nashville, not too far from you folks. And uh, a daughter who lives in Birmingham. Both delightful children. It was a, a fine, a fine family, no question about it. And I miss him. I miss him. And he's been gone a long time. Uh, 
one day we were at a funeral in the old cemetery. And as we came out, uh, we passed the grave site that they were had bought to use. Dr. Allison said, now, Gordon, one of these days you're going to have to lay us away here. But we've had a good time, haven't we? <laughs> well, he's there, but Miss Allison is still, she's still holding on. Wonderful lady. Well, do you think of anything else? I've, hmm? I've about used up my questions. You've uh, used up your questions? Well, I don't know. I guess I've used up my recollections, or a good many of them. But uh, did you, you told me you listened to that tape over there. Well, I read the transcript. I didn't listen. Oh, did you? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I told Dr. Carr you were coming and uh, asked him if he would come over and sit with us. And he said he would, but I called him just after you called me, you know, <laughs> after you know. And I couldn't get an answer, so I don't know if they've gone off or what. But, uh, but he and I and uh, Dr. Allison and the archivist sat there for two or three mornings and talked about Auburn and research and all of that. And uh, it's really uh, a history of what of his life, you know, as a physicist. It's an undergraduate. Very interesting tape, I think. Did he have any habits that are unique or well, his his nickname of bullet was <laughs> was a pretty good one. <laughs> He didn't lose any time. He, he didn't live far from the campus. In fact, he was right across the street. Uh, but he was, uh, he was very active, very active. Uh, Bullet was a good, a good nickname for him. He got along with Got along with everybody, as far as I know. I remember uh, he told me one day that he he had uh, uh, a, some kind of a disease that attacked him once in a while. Uh, turns your skin red. Do you know what that was? No, I've seen. Well, anyway, penicillin was supposed to get you over the best part of that. Uh, or the worst part of that, uh, that trouble. And he had an outbreak one time, and he went to a doctor here in town, and uh, the doctor said, yes, he'd give him a shot of penicillin. He said, now, take your pants down. This man had been a student of Dr. Allison's once. And the man said, now, I'm going to give you a shot in the hip. And I wanted, I've been wanting to do this for a long, long time. <laughs> After the shot, Dr. Ellison went to church. And you know, he just about passed out in the church from that shot. <laughs> they had to help him out of the church. <laughs> he laughed about that many, many times. Dr. Thomas telling him that, that just about having to pass out. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had a lot of fun. We used to, when we were out in New Mexico together, we always went down to Juarez with them on the weekends, and we would have a fine time. Miss Allison, Dr. Allison, and Agnes and myself, <laughs> we would shop in in Juarez for all the junk. Of you know, stuff that they have. But we had wonderful times. Wonderful times. Towards the end of his life, but before he had given up his lamb, 
we took him to a doctor in Montgomery. Even before that, we would go down once a week on Wednesday. And when he was teaching at Huntington, and we would have supper at a, a cafeteria in one of the shopping centers there, and my wife, Miss Allison, would shop while Dr. Allison and I talked research. Because I was still doing things for him. He'd come up on the weekend and try them out or something. And, so on. and uh, that was that was wonderful to do that. Was, we'd see him once a week. And, and we would walk along in the, in the mall down there and uh, come across some of his old students. And I remember one fella came along there and said, uh, Dr. Allison, go oh, good to see you. He said, I never will forget your class. One of the jokes you told us. Dr. Allison says, is that all you remember? Oh, yeah, about all. <laughs> he said, what was the joke? And uh, the fellow said, well, uh, you asked us one day when you were showing us a demonstration of high voltage. You had a, a piece of metal there cut like a, a German cross. And he said, do you know how to make a, a malt, as they call it, a Maltese cross, you know, a funny shape. He said, do you know how to make a Maltese cross? And the fellow says, no. And Dr. Allison says, you pull his tail. <laughs> <laughs> and you can imagine telling a class like that. But he, when he went up to teach at, Wash, at uh, Emory and Henry, when they came back one time, I said, well, are you enjoying it up there? He said, well, as a matter of fact, those boys, he said, they're so Scotch. He said, they're, they're, their ancestors are Scotch. And he said, you know, I've told them one story after another. And they're so serious, I haven't gotten the first laugh out of any of them. And I said, well, you aren't giving up, are you? No, he said, I'm not giving up. But if they want good grades, they better start laughing. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. He was he was good. Well, I'm afraid you got a kind of a mixed up uh, <laughs> tape there. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Selwood uh, was in Illinois when I was there and was a hard worker, very hard. But he also liked to play golf with us and there was uh, R.W. Ball, Selwood, myself, Kramers. We all played out there. This is a short course. But Selwood was the kind of a fella who was um, Oh, I don't know, a little, uh, he kind of looked down his nose at us, I thought, sometimes. And his roommate was Ball. But what did Ball do? Going along the course, I think Selwyn had put his bag down and gone off to find the ball somewhere. And R.W. Ball found a stone, a round stone, about as big around as a, was just about big enough that it would go in the golf bag. And he took the clubs out and put the stone in, put the clubs back. Selwood carried that thing around for about three or four days. And finally he picked it up and it hit him on the ankle as it swung past his leg. And he cussed a moment and took his clubs out and dumped that thing out. And then he wouldn't talk to us for about a week. <laughs> it was a pretty hilarious time there for a while. But that's what I remember about Selwood, except he was a hard worker and a real nice guy, but a little bit on the uppity side, say. Did you keep in contact with him after Illinois? Or? Uh, I only kept in contact with him long enough to know that he was at Northwestern. 
But after that, I lost track. And at Illinois, he worked with whom? He worked with Hopkins. And on? On the Linium, on the rare earths, yeah. But did he use magnetization there, or? No, no, no. He, he used, he was an optical spectroscopist. No, I don't know. Well, he did some work on magnetic susceptibility when he was there. I don't remember just what it was. We had a susceptibility balance, and that was about it. But I, I didn't keep up with that. I didn't know what he was doing, really, because uh, my work was pretty routine for a long time with, uh, with uh, fractional crystallization. We did. We had one laboratory there where Selwood had his office. Um, the the fractional crystallization was uh, sometimes with nitrates, and there was always an excess of nitric acid around. And I remember when Selwood was there, um, a man from Buildings and Grounds at the university came over and wanted us to all come outside, Dr. Hopkins and everybody. And he pointed up to the roof above our windows on the third floor. And we could see that the nitric acid had simply dissolved the gutter along the top of those windows. And I thought to myself many times since then, well, you know, nobody ever had a cold in that lab. <laughs> they could, a germ, a cold bacteria, a germ, virus, or whatever, couldn't have lived there. And we were a very healthy bunch. And uh, beside that, we had a, an x-ray machine, which didn't have much shielding. And I remember that uh, we were all wondering if we would ever have any families after that. And one of the fellows said, well, so-and-so, he didn't know about him, but he said, you know, he doesn't throw stones at paper boys. <laughs> So we never, I never kept up with that guy either. I forgot what his name was even. Well, now, was this Kramer the one that went to DuPont? No, that was Ball that went to DuPont. Kramer's went to, um, oh, the company that makes big crystals. Hawshaw Fuller did one. He went to that. That was a colloidal, hmm? si there was a colloidal sinus that, DuPont named Kramer's that uh, came up with the inkwell theory for porosity. Uh -huh. That wasn't no, it. no. This Kramer went to Harshaw and made uh, old big crystals. You know, they were making big crystals of salt for infrared work and uh, old uh, silver chloride and some of those other things. Big crystals, you know, pounds mm -hmm. at a time. But his interest at Illinois was in uh, was in uh, chromium plating, at least at one time it was. Do you recall anything else about Selwood? Uh... Well, uh, no, I really don't. We all belong to the same fraternity there, finally. <coughs> Um, oh, what was the name of that thing? I can't remember the name of the fraternity now. I remember this Mr. Ball, Dr. Ball. We all were taken into Sigma Xi at the same time. And when they were reading off something that we were supposed to answer, I do, Ball answered present. <laughs> <laughs> and I had an interesting experience in Illinois when I was teaching. First time I'd taught any. And I had an older man in the class. Turned out he was a preacher. And I had been doing my best to give them a good lecture, the first one I'd ever done. 
And when I got all done, he was the last one to go out of the room. And he turned around and said, was this the first class you ever taught? <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, that settles you down pretty quick. <laughs> You mentioned Selwood uh, as an experimentalist. Uh, he did a lot of lab work himself. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yes. He did a lot. He was excellent with the spectrograph. We had a big uh, eagle mounted or literal mounted spectrograph, and uh, he really mastered the instrument. It was a little tricky to do, but he was good at it. He took many, many pictures and uh, was an untiring worker at analyzing spectra, spectra, spectra of the rare earths. And he was the one who, who picked out what he thought was the lines of illidium that were later used, as I was telling you. And he was a very hard worker. But not much of a golfer. <laughs> not much. And that was the only sport he indulged in? Or? As far as I know, that's all that any of us indulged in. Uh, the last two years I was at Illinois, the, the, the university, had, the athletic department, had developed a, uh, an ice rink. And uh, we liked to skate. And we also liked to go over towards Danville where there were some strip mines, and in the wintertime we'd play hockey over there. Sort of play hockey. It was uh, pretty <laughs> crude exhibitions of hockey, I think. But a lot of fun. Well, those were good days in Illinois. And how many graduate students would they have in chemistry at Illinois at that time? At, at Illinois? They started out when I was there they had about 80, and five years later, they had around 350. So it, was, it grew to the point where uh, uh, you didn't know many people. Was Adams there at that time? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes, Roger Adams. Baylor, John, John? Baylor, do you know him? Yes. Well. John Baylor was my wife's boss for many, several years. And John and Florence, his wife, did you know her? Well, they, uh, John kept telling me that I had better date my future wife many, many times. I don't know how many times he told me that. Or somebody else was going to get that girl. So uh, I did, and dated her, and we got married, uh, happily, I must say, 50, 55 um, years ago. But John Baylor was lecturing one day, and Florence, his girlfriend, was sitting up. She was, a, she was a, an instructor. She was on the staff, you know. She wasn't. She didn't have any doctor's degree or anything. But she was sitting up in the top of the auditorium. This was freshman students. And uh, John was demonstrating a little hydrogen cannon. He had a piece of pipe, and he filled it with hydrogen. He had a, a rather large cork in the front of it and said he would, uh, he would aim it up there at Florence. And of course, he didn't know where that thing was going. <laughs> and darn if it didn't go right up there and smack her on the cheek. And when that happened, it didn't hurt her. But he said, I'm going to have to date that girl and make up for this. <laughs> he told the class that. And that's exactly what he did. And they finally were married. So that's really hitting them. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I remember John Baylor. Did you have any courses to him? Courses with him? No, no, no. 
Well, he must have been rather young then, wasn't he? Oh, yes, yes. He came there just right out of graduate school. Yeah. Uh, they separated all of the freshman students. They built a new building for freshman chemistry, and I believe sophomore analytic chemistry was in a separate building. And then my wife uh, went over there as John Baylor's uh, clerk, uh, assistant, or whatever you wanted to call him. She did the whole thing. And uh, Dr. Hopkins uh, took only the the upper classes then, and rare element chemistry, that sort of thing. I don't remember if he had another secretary or not. Oh, there was a man named Audrieth. Did you know Lou Audrieth? I know the name, but not the man. Well, he was there at that time. And, uh, Carter, there was a man named Carter who came, became the head of the Department of Illinois. He was there as a graduate student at that time. Oh, who else was there? Rose, Dr. Rose. There was a Dr. Davino who was there, who got a Nobel Prize. I think he went to uh, um, oh, the New York one of the school in New York, not to Brooklyn Polytechnic, but another one that's there. But he was a, he was a uh, physiological chemist. I know some of these people because they dated my wife before I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, was Selwood married when he was a graduate student? Or? No, no, no. There were no married graduate nope. students that I knew of. No. No, I don't think any of those people were married. Well, you know, on forty, fifty, sixty dollars a month, you could barely make it. <laughs> no, it was it was kind of tough going, I think. How would you compare graduate school then to today? Well, of course, I see it from the point of view of physics now, not chemistry. Um, I would say that we're a little tougher on graduate students. Some graduate students in physics are just uh, low-paid help, in my opinion. I feel that uh, Whenever I had a graduate student, I laid out a program, and when it was finished, that was that. And some of the people that I know uh, just uh, lay out one program after another, and the student just hardly gets, gets long. You were talking about Dr. Ballard at Florida. Well, a very good uh, student that I had, very good student, went down there as a graduate student in physics called me one day on the phone and wanted to know what I thought of his changing over to engineering. And I told him I didn't think he'd be making any friends if he did that. But uh, if he wanted to, that was his business. Well, he did. Changed over because he'd been there for several years and hadn't gotten anywhere. He could, couldn't see the end. And uh, when he went over in engineering, he got in, in um, uh, fluid mechanics, and uh, uh, got his degree, stayed there on the staff, and now he's very outstanding in fluid mechanics. So he translates from the Russian, he does all sorts, all that kind of thing. Very outstanding man. But, we had help when we took exams at Illinois. There was a lady in the library. The, uh, the German exam uh, was always given in the library, and she was German. And I recall one time somebody was there taking an exam, and the answer was uh, alternating current was to do something. And my question was, uh, 
suppose you used to some kind of current, what would you use, DC? And she sat there behind the questioner, facing the applicant, going like this. <laughs> and, you know, now that kind of help was, was fine. But uh, I don't think physics people today do that sort of thing at all. But that's physics, not chemistry. Maybe chemists are a little more uh, reasonable. How would you compare the coursework? Is it the same level or? Oh, it's probably the same level. Yes, it's probably the same level. Um, you didn't have to know too much mathematics and chemistry, I didn't think. Now maybe today you have to know a lot of quantum mechanics, but uh, in, in physics you better know a lot of mathematics. You better be pretty good on the computer. I don't know about chemistry, but if you don't know the ins and outs of uh, computer technology, you just are up against a real tough thing in physics. Well, how long did it take to get a PhD in chemistry in Illinois in the 30s? In the 30s? Well, I got it in three years. Every summer, but three years was I had it. And I remember Dr. Hopkins telling me at my final exam, as we were walking towards the final exam, he said, now I want to tell you something. Um, he said, you know, uh, this final exam is supposed to, to uh, be quite complete and all of that. But he said, there is a baseball game that starts at 3.30. And he said, I don't want to hear any long answers. And that was that. We made the baseball game. And after we came out of the exam, he always called me Dr. Hughes. He never made a mistake. <laughs> I didn't see how he could do it, really. He was a fine man, too. But, you know, most of them are fine. I don't I don't know many people who I don't feel are pretty good. Did you know Selwood personally, or was this just... Selwood? Yes. Was oh, this... Yes, yes. I have an office right in the same lab with him. Yes. We were very close. When I was telling you we would go and get an omelet, mm -hmm. it was Ball, Selwood, Quill, and me. Dr. Quill was not married then. Dr. Quill was the, a little older than we were. He had his PhD. He was on the staff. He later moved to be the head of the department at Michigan State. But that was the Quill. Um, he's retired a long time now. Lives in, in uh, Arizona. But we were all very close. We go to picture show together. We eat together, and after we after we uh, had any money at all and ate over at the uh, faculty club, we all ate at the same table, you know. It was just a, just a good group. There's a, there's a little restaurant, there was a little restaurant, they still be there, you know, right almost outside the chemistry department at Illinois. And, uh, we would go over there and, and eat over there quite often. But if you had trouble, you had help from the others. And they had help from you. We were very close. Ball was an easygoing guy. Selwood, I would say, would have been a little harder to, to uh, get along with if things weren't going quite right. But there was nothing wrong with him. Tall and thin. Was he tall and thin when you knew him? I only met him one time. Uh -huh. He wasn't too thin. Mm -hmm. He was from British Columbia. 
ball was from British Columbia. Selwood told me one time that uh, when he was young, he had uh, rheumatic fever, I think it was, with some heart condition that wasn't, wasn't good. And his mother kept him home most of the time. But when he got older, he, he spent the summer with the uh, Canadian Geologic Survey or something like that. And they walked over a good share of northern Canada. And he said he, he felt much better after that. A whole summer doing that. Did, did he have a family? Yes. Did he? I'm not sure how many children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I tried to look him up once in, in uh, Santa Barbara, but I didn't find him. We were there for something or other. I tried to find him, but I didn't. What would be a typical day in graduate school? Uh, the time you start, uh, you quit when you were there? Well, I would say you would have, you would have uh, two classes if you were still taking classwork. You'd have maybe two classes, so one in the inorganic boys at least would have uh, one with Dr. Hopkins on some of the rare elements and one maybe with uh, Mr. Dr. Reedy who was, uh, I've got a telephone to turn it on, teaching, would be uh, working in the lab. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was teaching, you attended a lecture and then you taught the lab. That was the, and I don't remember whether we had lab every day, once a week or what it was, but we attended all the lectures. That's where I knew uh, <laughs> Dr. Baylor the best. There was a man named Mr. Peel at Illinois who was the technician. And he would make up all these demonstration experiments and put them out on the table. And uh, I remember Dr. Baylor one time was trying to do something, and it didn't quite work. And he said, well, I've got to go on. Mr. Peel will carry out this experiment. And that man just picked it up and carried it right back <laughs> into the stock room. And <laughs> Dr. Baylor looked he was simply put out with a fellow. <laughs> but we had another man, what was his name? Pierce. Dennis Pierce. Did you ever know a chemist named Dennis Pierce? I can't remember. I think he went over to Earlham College in the in Indiana, Richmond, Indiana, or some little town. Not too far from Indianapolis. But he always was demonstrating things. <laughs> he was going to, he was explaining something about gunpowder one day, and he was going to shoot off a firecracker. <laughs> and he had it down back at the desk. He was going to bring it up, you know, a little bit and let go. <laughs> and he, he got talking too long. It went off in his hand, down back in the desk. <laughs> oh, dear. You know, funny things happen in classes. Um, one day I came in the lecture room, and somebody had put a little turtle in the wastebasket. And we were talking about gas dynamics. <laughs> and probability of this happening and that happening. And I remembered saying to the class, what would 
would you think the probability would be of finding a turtle in the wastebasket? <laughs> and they all agreed it was very improbable. So I picked it up and dumped it out on the table. <laughs> it was a turtle. <laughs> Oh, teaching was a lot of fun. You never knew what was going to happen. Don't you find it a lot of fun? No. I don't think there's anything better. What do you think makes a good teacher? Well, I really don't know. I really don't know. A student said to me one time, you know, when, when they ask you a question, you never do answer it. And I said to him, well, do you know what the answer ought to be when I get through talking? Yeah. But he says, you're always saying, well, look at it this way. And then you start off, and pretty soon it's just clear what it ought to be. But you never answer the question. <laughs> I felt like saying, well, I'm a politician. <laughs> But I think that uh, that if you can if you can get students to ask questions, that's probably the best way to teach. And if you answer questions, a lot of them, the first of the hour, and gradually bring it into the current day's work. You've, you've done a pretty good one. It's worked out pretty well for you, for them. And I remember one student asked me something or other, and I explained it to him. I was just about finished explaining it. And the boy's face brightened up, and he said, Well, I'll be damned. <laughs> right then, I knew I'd convinced him. <laughs> yeah, I knew I'd, I'd sold that one. What do you think it takes to make a good teacher? I guess it depends a lot on the student. Uh, mm -hmm. You can't be a good teacher for the whole class, I don't think. Uh, Right after the war, we had a lot of the Second World War. We had a lot of uh, students who had been in the Navy, in the Army, in the Air Force, Marines, whatnot, and uh, they were being paid in part by the government. And one of the things that they had to do was to wear their uniforms on Wednesday. Well, Wednesday was the day you had to, you know, I always met the class and they asked all the questions they wanted to, I had no advanced work. And those boys asked a lot of questions. And you could tell, you know, which ones were the military. They asked a lot of questions. And I thought, always thought that, that was that was some of the best that I had. Uh, the best students and the best, uh, the, the best, you know, connection between me and the class. But I must admit, every time I went into a class, the first day it was a little, I was a little fluttery. Were you? No. Yes. Yeah, I am. Always. But I have a little demonstration that uh, I always show them that uh, dispelled all of that. I took a spool of that big around. Had a rather large center. I think it was probably used for wire or something. And uh, put a string around it and the center of it. And you could uh, you could hold that thing up, pull on it, and the spool would roll away. And then he'd say something about, you know, physics is just explaining things, simple things. And I'd slowly lower my hand and pull on the string, and the spool would roll back. <laughs> when he pulled down, it was low. 
And uh, yeah, I just keep on talking. I say, well, now it'll roll either way. Uh, surely there must be something you can do so it won't roll at all. And you just raise your hand a little bit, you know. You slide the thing along the table. And you can just see students begin to worry. <laughs> There's more there than met the eye. They can see the whole thing. And uh, then you would explain that on the board, the blackboard. And it was perfectly clear to me, and I think to them, what I was doing. And I'd show it to them again. You know, move your hands so they'd see what you're doing. And I always thought that was the best way I knew to start the class. That was a good one. So simple. And whenever I could, I related things to uh, to sports. And you see a fellow punting the football, and you start counting seconds to see how long it's in the air. And then you calculate how far it goes and how high it goes and all of that. And I had some demonstrations that students just loved, and they always wanted a repeat performance. I had a real good one one time. Uh, Dr. Allison showed me. Uh, we had a string on a sounding box, and the string was about a meter long. And we had an old violin bowl, and you could bowl the thing, make a sound. And then you could bow it up close to one end and make it sound a little different. And I would tell them that the string was vibrating in a number of sections. And if you put your finger at some place on the string, then the string would vibrate, broken up, depending on where you put your finger. So then I'd take some little pieces of paper, oh, maybe a quarter inch wide and an inch long, fold it up like that so it would hang over the string. And I'd say, now, we can, we can see this because if I put this the little loop of paper where there is a lot of vibration, it'll jump off. And if I put it where there's no vibration, well, it'll stay on. So I would take the, i say I'm going to bow it at 10 centimeters from the end, and I'll put my finger on the 20. Now, it's really vibrating at the 10. So it'll really vibrate at the, if I bow it at the 10 and put my finger at the 20, it'll really vibrate at the 30 then, and not at the 40, and so on. And I'd put papers all along there. And then I'd bow it, and every other one would jump off. I couldn't believe it. They'd want that thing over again. <laughs> you know. It was, it was very interesting, the reaction of the student. Everybody in the class wanted the same thing. They just didn't believe it. And you'd explain it to them, and it worked fine. And polarized light, they loved those experiments with polarized light. Beautiful colors, all kinds of things. But I don't think students get that now. I don't think they do. Well, surely your tape is about used up by now.